Hi, Ashley. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. And so I am glad to finally have the opportunity to interview you. Yes. And so we're going to start at the beginning. So where were you born? Um, I was born in Cottonwood. And when were you born? 1985. And how was it growing up in Cottonwood? Um, we lived there for a few years, and then I moved to Young, Arizona, um, which is a small town out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and how is that? How was Young, Arizona? It was good. You learn a lot of stuff of growing up in the country. Um, we had five miles of pavement through town and 30 miles of dirt road each way to get out of town. So you learn a lot of stuff. And so did you grow up in a ranch setting? Um... Not personally. I mean, there were ranches all around us, but yeah, you grew up in the country, hunting, fishing, all that kind of stuff. And so what schools did you go to? They had one school in town. We had um, 83 kids in our entire school. That was kindergarten through 12th grade. So you knew everybody in town. Wow. <laughs> and what did you guys do for fun up there besides fishing and all of that? Um, that was pretty much it. We had our gym cannas and horses and hunting and just living out in the mountains. And so did you do a lot of hunting and horsing then? Too? Yeah. And you still currently like horses, right? You know? Yes, yes. Do you, do you own horses still? Uh, we do. Our last horse is up at the ranch right now uh, with my father-in-law, but we've had horses our entire life. My husband shoes horses and we've always done roping and gym cannas and it's just the last year we've kind of gotten out of it. And uh, when did you meet your husband? Um, in 2005, the end of 2005. And did you meet, meet him here in Dewey Humboldt? Or yes, in Cottonwood? here. Here, okay. And then uh, do you have any children? Yes, we have four kids. Four kids, okay. And what are their ages? And I don't know if you want to say their names. Um, our oldest daughter is 16. Um, we have an almost 11-year-old son a four-year-old son, and almost two-year-old son. Wow, so you have the whole spectrum. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, why did you decide to move to the Dewey Humboldt area? Uh, my mom and my aunt lived up here. Um, and at the time, I was living down in the valley, and I am not a big city or the heat kind of person, so I moved up here. Did you go to school in in the Valley? No, I went to school in Young. Um, I graduated um, from Young, and it was in my late teens, early 20s that I lived in the Valley for about a year. Okay. And then, um, so then you knew that your mom, to, mom and aunt lived here, so would you visit them? Okay. Yeah, I came up um, to visit a few times, and... When I was up here visiting one time, I had a, a heart condition, um, and the doctor told me I couldn't live alone at the time, so I had moved up here with my mom, um, and then I met my husband. And what was that uh, time period? Um, that was like the beginning of 2005. I think I moved up here, I think it was about August 2005. And so is that when you decided to permanently move here? It wasn't necessarily a, a permanent thing. Um, I had to live with my mom and my aunt um, while I got my heart stuff taken care of. And then I met my husband at the, I think it was December 2005. Um, and he, he grew up here, so this was his hometown, so it's just where we stayed. Mm -hmm. And then do you currently live then here in Dewey Humboldt? Yes. And then, um, when did you first become aware of the Iron King mine tailings and the smelter? Um, when we initially bought this house, um, because you can see the smelter from our front steps, I had asked the realtor, um, maybe it was my mother-in-law who actually asked the realtor about the, the smelter site. And she told us, oh, there's been some issues with it, but they're cleaning it up. It's no big deal. So we never really thought much about it. It wasn't until 2007, I believe, I got a flyer in the mail <clears throat> from EPA talking about the contamination. And what was your first reaction to that? 
um, kind of disbelief. Um, our daughter had been having quite a bit of breathing problems ever since we lived in Humboldt. So it just kind of all came together for me at that point. And uh, how about, um, did you then through this flyer learn about the <clears throat> contamination or did you do any independent research? Oh, it was pretty much all independent research. <clears throat> you couldn't really get, um, still can't sometimes, a straight answer out of anyone in the town council. Um, EPA does their best, but they're very limited on what they can legally tell you or, you know, they can give you a lot of pointers and where to research, but most of mine came from independent research over the internet. And then did you also start researching your daughter's um, health? In yeah, as, as I started um, just researching the common things that were found in the area, um, a lot of them related to some of the stuff that she was experiencing. So I got in contact um, through her doctor and the U of A doctors and um, did a lot of research on her, her breathing issues. And then can you tell me, I think that when I first met you, you told me a little bit about the story that uh, you took your daughter to get tested. Yeah, so we did, um, I requested a heavy metals test on her when she was in the hospital having one of her breathing problems. Um, and they tested the heavy metals and it came back with arsenic and beryllium in her blood. Um, so when I started talking with Dr. Klemecki at the U of A on what beryllium was and what it could or couldn't do, um, he felt that there was a very good possibility that her body had developed an allergic reaction to inhaling the beryllium. Um, the only way they could determine that was to put her under anesthesia and take a sample of her lung tissue to determine it. And we stopped at that point because she was... She was fairly young, I'm going to say six or seven, and we weren't willing to put her through that. Um, so we just kind of went more on the the maintaining her symptoms, treating her symptoms as they came. And so what was part of that, the treatment that you were given by doctors? A lot of steroids, breathing treatments, hospitalizations. Um, that pretty much the only way we try to manage it at home, you know, with a lot of steroids and breathing treatments. And when it got too bad, then she went to the hospital for three or four days. And would she go down to then Phoenix area hospitals? Most of it was emergency rooms um, in this area. A lot of times I would take her, her doctors in Cottonwood. So I would take her to that emergency room. But we did make specialized trips down to the U of A doctors but in emergency situations it was here and were any of your other children uh had any health impacts um so our son at at the time when i was really involved with what was going on it was just our oldest daughter and our oldest son we didn't have the two little ones um so he had he had had some testing done and he had lead in his system um and it, it wasn't extremely high, but it was concerning enough for him. Um, and the two younger ones, we haven't had them, them tested yet, but our middle son has started having some breathing issues as well. Okay. And has his breathing issues been looked at by a doctor, like similar to your other daughter, like some of the tests that she... No, not yet. Um, his are... His are fairly manageable, you know, with the breathing treatments. Um, but it has been something we talked about, just getting the simple blood work done to find out what's in a system now. Mm -hmm. And then do you, as a homeowner, do you think that you received adequate information on the site when you moved in? No, not at all, not even close. Uh, and the, you did ask the real estate agents, but they said they were... We did ask, and she just kind of, you know, shrugged her shoulders and said they're cleaning it up, it's no big deal. Um, and that wasn't the case mm -hmm. at all. Um, and for us, a lot of our house, like our brick walkways or the, the, my, or the bricks from the smelter that they used to build that, our water tanks um, actually came from the mine where they processed the cyanide and 
So no, that was never disclosed to us. So is it a, t a water tank that you have here on your property? We don't have it now. We got rid of it. But when we bought the house and right after we bought is when the market fell really bad. So we could tell by looking at the water storage tanks that they weren't good. It was one of the things we were going to have to replace. Um, but when the market fell so bad, it just kind of fell on the back burner. So we kept using them. And as I was doing my research into the activities at Iron King Mine, um, I had been looking at some Google Earth photos and stuff and uh, came across our water tanks, the exact ones that were up at the mine. And they would mix them with... Um, they would put the, the gold or whatever, you know, in there. They'd mix it with the cyanide and then get the gold out of it afterwards. So in the summertime, when the tanks would heat up, um, there would be this film on the top of our, our water. It was whatever was leaching out of the side of the tanks. and So that kind of stuff was very discouraging. The more I researched, the more I found what we lived with. and. And so then in addition to that tank, you said you had also the bricks? Yes. So the the bricks, there were five smelter stacks at one time. Um, so both of our back patios, they're really neat bricks just to look at them. You can tell they're old. Um, they say Carnegie on them, and they're cut at a slant. Well, it wasn't until, again, I was doing research and... You know, I went over to the smelter and I looked at some of the stuff and I finally had EPA out to look at them and they told me, yes, these are the exact bricks that they were made out of. So, and I know we can't be the only ones. Um, you know, I think as they were shutting stuff down, you know, property owners probably sold some of this stuff at a small fee and people that were building their houses on their own, trying to do low cost, you know, got what they could. Um, so I'm sure we're not the only ones that have those issues. <laughs> and that makes sense, right? Yeah. And then how, and then, so I, from our conversation, you were involved at the community level also. Um, and when did you become involved in the community level with the Superfund site? Oh, I don't, I don't know exactly. I know as I started doing research, it was just only natural for me to start talking to people. Um, and so it, it was just kind of a snowball effect. You know, you, you just start talking to one person and pretty soon someone else wants to talk to you to find out. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say like 2008 is probably when I... No, I'm going to say 2009, I think. Okay. So that was like kind of when they were establishing and there was a lot of EP activity. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, can you tell me, like, well, I guess what was going on at that time? Like, were they having community meetings? What are some of the things that you were involved in? At the time, there wasn't a whole lot of meetings. Um, EPA just kind of started coming on the on scene. Um, and for our community, kind of being out in the country a little bit, um, nobody really wanted to talk to EPA. They all kind of said, once you let them on your property, um, they don't go away. You know, people kept saying it was whatever EPA was doing was hurting the values of their homes. And so it it took a lot of agreeing with people on that and kind of talking them through it to really get people to be aware of the concern that was here. Um, so that... You know, that took a lot of time and <laughs> effort for it. Yeah, and so then it seems like how you're saying that you, because of your experience living in rural, like Arizona, you know kind of how to talk to people and... Yeah, yeah, you know, I think um, just knowing what the concerns are, you know, for your community and understanding how all the politics work <laughs> in your area... Um, but it wasn't, I went to a lot of the town council meetings, EPA meetings, um, and a lot of that I would have meetings here at the house and then would share that information with other people that didn't want to go to the meetings. Um, so there really hasn't been 
a whole lot of community activity. You know, I think most of the community is looking for for one person to kind of stand up and be the voice of the entire community. And then, um, can you talk about uh, also your involvement in some of the health, local health studies that were being conducted in like the, the time period that you became involved? Um, we participated in, I'm pretty sure, almost every study that U of A or EPA has done. Um, we participated in the, the garden study. I forget the exact name of it. Um, the health study, we actually got quite a few people to show up for that, um, the lead testing of the kids. Um, water testing, the property testing, we have participated in all of it. And were you an actual uh, technical person as part of the research team, or were you just a participant of the actual study? Just a participant of it. And what did you learn from those studies? Um that all my concerns were valid. <laughs> they were, <laughs> um, we learned that the place in our yard that we were growing our garden and our vegetable, they were taking up arsenic and lead, um, that our water is contaminated, that the soil is contaminated. Um, our kids did have lead in their system. And so it just kind of confirmed everything that we already, already knew. And did they provide you any uh, ways of reducing your exposure to the contamination that you found in your property? Yeah. Um, I mean, the simple things, take your shoes off before you come inside, don't let your kids play in the dirt, um, you know, do raised garden beds, th that kind of stuff. Um, but when there was no control over the actual contaminants themselves, and the dust blowing all over town, all that kind of seemed like it wasn't going to do any good, basically. So. Yeah, so I saw some photographs from, um, the, I guess, the site when the wind would blow and how dusty it would be. Did you ever encounter that then, like what you mentioned? Yeah, um, so I've taken a lot of pictures over the years of the dust blowing, and actually... Um, I had taken the pictures down to the town council at one point because nobody seemed to think it was that big of a concern, but you literally can't see the houses on the other side of the creek when it's blowing. They immediately um, faxed them to EPA, and it was like the next week or two they were out here and applied, I think they called it gorilla snot, onto the smelter site, um, which seemed to help for a time. but. They explain that if anybody steps on it or animals step on it, it breaks the crust of that. So um, they didn't do anything to keep people off of the smelter site. It's a big hangout spot for teenagers and anyone else that goes down the river. Um, so now it's back to what it was then. It blows pretty consistently. Okay. And then... Um uh, do, then, so that so that dust that you're talking about is at the smelter site. It's both sites. So, Iron King um, would blow the orange dirt all over, and then the smelter site, the lead ash pile, would blow on this side. So you were getting the worst of everything in town. <laughs> And then, as you mentioned, that so currently there's people that are, like, because that area is fenced out in the smelter, correct? No. No, it's not? No. Oh, there's okay. no fencing around the smelter. There's fencing on the, the front side in town, but on the back side, um, like where we're at over here, there's no fencing. Okay. People walk down the creek and straight up to the smelter stack. Yeah, because I noticed the, the smelter is, like, falling apart on the top. Is that something that you have observed before? Yeah, I mean, you, you watch it, you know, over the years. It, it's definitely crumbling. Um, but there's, there's a lot of people that hang out in the river. It's not a very good spot at all. You don't want to be down there. Um, but they use, there's a cave in the, the slag pile, that they hang out with or they hide their stuff in and the teenagers come up and down the river and so there's a lot of activity that goes on 
up there. In that area. Okay. Yeah. And then um, I'm just going to go back a little bit and talk about your children. Um, and did you said uh, that you worked with people at the University of Arizona regarding uh, their health. And I was wondering, I, you mentioned Dr. Klemecki that you uh -huh. talked to him. Were there uh, any other researchers that you worked with at the University of Arizona? Um, there were other other doctors. I don't remember their names specifically. Um, a lot of my communication with Dr. Klemecki, there were a few times he came to town, but a lot of it was over email or, or phone calls. I know he did a lot of research out of the country and that kind of stuff. Um, but actually, when I started going to their pediatrician, they referred me to the U of A. So um, it was just kind of whatever doctor they referred me to at the time. Okay. But Dr. Klemecki was always behind the scene telling me, you know, ask for this test or look for this or that kind of stuff. Okay. And then... Um did you, when you were out there, like, doing the research, you're now talking to people, you're having meetings in, here at your home, talking to others, were there any health issues that you started uh, noticing or any patterns that you started putting together? Pancreatic cancer <laughs> was the main thing. Um, I think I can count 11 people within a quarter mile of me that have died of pancreatic cancer. Um, three on my block. Um, there was a lot of bladder cancers. Um, so for me, we had, we had talked to um, the Yavapai County Health Director about doing a study for a cancer cluster. Um, and he had agreed to it when he met with us, and then the next week he just kind of fell off the face of the earth. We couldn't find him anymore. He wasn't at that job anymore, um, and that's just kind of where it's where it's all stayed. When you talk to EPA about health concerns, they're environmental, so they can't really, you know, they can tell you have elevated levels here or there, but as far as getting any kind of study or anything done, um, they're not much help in that area. And then have you ever spoken to uh, the Agency for Toxic Disease Registry or some ATSDR, what they call? I'm just curious if other agencies have been in the area. Yeah, um, they've been in the area. Um, it just... I don't know if it's the lack of the, the community each voicing their own opinion that, you know, doesn't get it noticed. Um, a lot of people seem to be sick or, you know, so they don't really have extra energy to put out there. They're busy fighting their own battles but not realizing what they live with is causing it. Um, so that's just kind of where I've run into is finding somebody who can be loud enough to get the attention from them. And so I'm, I'm curious, in addition to the bladder cancer and the pancreatic cancer, is there anything else that you've seen kind of patterns? In the um, there's a lot of breathing issues, um, like my kids. Um, there's been quite a few lung cancers in the area. Um, that's been the main one. I, I would say the breathing and pancreatic cancer is big. And so it's just been through talking to people that you've kind of been noting yeah. some of these diseases. Yeah. Yeah, you just get out there and start talking to somebody, and um, they say, oh, yeah, my husband has pancreatic cancer. Or, and that's that's been hard because four, four or five of the pancreatic cancer patients were fairly close. I mean, they were... They were neighbors, you know, friends, people that I went to church with that, you know, their husbands ended up getting sick. And so each one of them want to call and know, you know, what am I doing? What what attention can I get brought to town? Um, you know, they're trying to look for answers on why their loved ones died.
Okay, Ashley, so we were talking a little bit about the work that you did with community members and just talking to them about the health issues that they're uh-huh. experiencing. And um, do you have anything else to add regarding some of this work? Like, it, have you been continuing it now? Because you started in the mid, I guess, 2000s. Yeah. And now it's like around like 10 years after, or yeah, like 10 years. Um, you know, it, it became very overwhelming um, for me and my family and having m- my daughter who was, you know, sick and had all the health issues. It became very overwhelming. Um, you kind of get to a point where all you hear is negative because um, people would pass my my number on along to other community members who needed someone to listen to them on their story and what they were battling, um, which was great. But when you got two young kids and and a family, it just became very overwhelming. Um, And there were very few people. I had some great people that really stood behind me and would come to the meetings and, you know, encourage me. Um, But for the most part, everyone kind of wanted me to be the voice. and I've never done anything like this. I mean, I, I haven't gone to school. You know, it was all research of my own and putting myself out there. So um, I kind of took a break from it. I had a really rough pregnancy with my third child and just kind of stopped participating in a lot of the meetings and, and stuff. I always I always stay up to date kind of in the back scenes of stuff, you know, the, the emails and what's going on. Um, but there were just two more people this last year that passed from pancreatic cancer. Um, and one of them, Don Wilson lived right across the river here. Um, and he was one, he's, he was an old Vietnam vet. I think he'd ran EPA off his property a few different times, didn't want to participate in anything. And I finally got the courage to go talk to him. He was kind of an intimidating kind of guy when you first met him. Um, But huge heart. I mean, he's just a great, great guy. And I convinced him to have his water tested through the U of A. Um, So he did, and EPA called him 1030 at night and told him, don't touch your water. You know, they thought they'd made a mistake. They said, there's something wrong we need to test again. So they, they were out there the next morning. And tested again, and it came back as 2,000 parts per million in his water. And uh, he had told me stories, you know, he'd make orange juice or whatever. He said he didn't drink it on a on a regular basis, but he cooked with it. And um, he said when he'd mix up orange juice with it, you know, the frozen cans, he said my kidneys would hurt when I'd drink it. He said my kidneys would just kill me. And so they put him on city water, and it was... I think a year or two later that he finally went to the doctor. I'm sure he probably hadn't gone in ages and pancreatic cancer that spread all throughout his body. And he lasted another year or so. So that one that one was hard for me, you know. Um, and up until the time he passed, he'd stay in contact and he'd come by and tell me, you know, keep fighting, keep doing it and he told his daughter, who's a little bit younger than I am, told her, don't you stay in this house another day. You sell it as soon as I'm gone. And he uh, he would dig up a lot of old bottles and stuff on his property. And doing research, there was actually the landfills where he his house was built um, directly across from the smelter. And back then it was kind of outside of town. So he was always digging up old bottles and stuff in his yard. Um but there's no doubt that the contamination led to led to his problems. So. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about that. Yeah. And then, um, were you ever part of the remediation efforts on the residential properties? Um, so we did. We had our yard tested and stuff. Um, and came back high in a few spots, and they told us that it wasn't high enough to clean up our property. There were a lot of homes that they wouldn't test. They said were outside of the boundaries. Um, But for a lot of years, 
the Iron King was giving away tailings as fill dirt. So the community w could go fill up their truck or whatever, um, and were actually taking tailings back to their property as fill dirt. So there's no way of telling exactly whose house is contaminated and whose isn't. Um, and when you talk to some of the old timers that when they talk about all five stacks burning at the same time, and the fallout from that stretched a long ways. Um, and even in, in the terms of the dust blowing off the smelter or the mine, I have pictures that show the orange dust cloud reaching Prescott Valley. So, you know, when they test a mile outside the boundary, that doesn't seem quite far enough at times. Um, but as far as, like, being involved with EPA's stuff, um, I had applied for the TAG grant when they first made that available, and um, we had some really good, really good people that were looking to be um, our advisor, or I forget the right name for it, um, but some people in the community had gotten involved and were kind of looking more for recognition than helping. And so I backed off the TAG grant, and I really didn't have any more involvement with it from then. And I know they did a few things within the community, but nothing that I really heard of or anybody said turned out well or not. So. And are you still involved? I think you've answered this, but I'm going to ask you anyways. Are you still involved in the community when it comes to the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter Superfund? Yeah, um, quietly at this point, <laughs> just because I don't have I don't have the energy right now. Um, I still keep you know up to date on what EPA is doing and and try to participate in any other studies or anything that goes on. Um, we actually have a lawsuit going right now against um, property owners and people that have had you know, things to do with that. Um, so that's kind of been my focus the last couple of years is just trying to get out of here, you know, because we lost so much value in our house. Um, and, you know, the market is so crazy up here right now. There's so many people moving in. I think that's probably my biggest concern right now is I watch people building new houses and moving in around here all over the time. I mean, it's just exploding. But nobody's talking about what's going on. Nobody is informing them. The realtors don't inform them. Um, so that, I don't want anyone else to be in the same situation we are, that, you know, you buy a place, you become knowledgeable of what you live with. Now it's up to you to pass that on and take the loss for it. And I don't think it's fair. And then, so I've, I hear that about this community, that there's a lot of people that are moving into the area, especially from California. That's mm -hmm. what I've heard that, um, I guess, have a lot of money to spend in different types of homes mm -hmm. in the area. Is that, has that been your experience? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> it's, the population's really exploding, and it seems to be a lot from California, from the fires or whatnot. But they can come over here and buy a piece of land and build a house for a fraction of what they could in California. And so they're just, they're all kind of living the dream. You know, they're building their dream house. They're living out in the country. It's all great and wonderful. So I don't know if it's they just don't want to believe or they're not being told or don't want to acknowledge it. But, but yeah, that's a big concern of people moving in and not knowing what's happening. And so are you still part of kind of the EPA listservs uh, that you get the information of the Superfund site? Uh, what other, how, how else do you get your information? Yeah, I still, um, I still get all the, the emails from EPA. Um, I get all the emails from the U of A. If I know that EPA is going to be in town, you know, I'll watch the, the town council meeting online to see what has been said or what's going on. Um, and I'm kind of getting motivated to get back on the scene and maybe try to be the voice of all the people that, you know, are, are too sick or, um, don't have the time to do it. 
or for the kids. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at right now, trying to push myself back into doing that. <laughs> And then thinking back on your experience at the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter Superfund site, what would you recommend or like to see future generations learn from this experience? Um, you know, I for me it's been it's been difficult because you know growing up in a small town like Young that has so much history with it, I love the history. I love being out, you know, looking at the old buildings or the old mines or I love that part of it and then to come out on this whole other side of the contamination and honestly if if my daughter hadn't gotten sick I probably would have turned a blind eye to it too I probably wouldn't have paid attention to it just you know everyone says oh it's been there for a hundred years it's fine well it's not fine um and so I guess just learning how to, the generations, to clean up what you do use, you know, to to leave it better for the next generation and, and for the kids, um, I think is the biggest thing I would hope for everyone to learn. And I know you're young, but I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, how would you like the memory of your experience to be remembered at this super fun site? Um... I guess, you know, I guess I would tell people not to be afraid to stand up for something you feel or you believe, because um, there was lots of times that I got turned away when I knocked on a door and said, do you know what you live with, and they kind of shut the door in my face, um, but I've brought to light for a lot of people what they're living with, you know, what it's causing, in return, they have better information for their doctors when they're going, you know, the proper blood tests to test for. And, you know, I, I went to high school and I went to some college, but I'm not greatly educated. Um, I just got up and spoke for what I, what I knew and what I believed. Um, so I guess that's what I'd want to be remembered. And then how do you think that the memory of the Superfund site and the contamination should be remembered or will be remembered? Um, you know, that that's hard to say. I mean, it, if we stopped it right now today and said, how is it remembered from this point on? I think a lot of our community would probably say, you know, it was a waste of time. It was a waste of money. That didn't because they don't actually see anything going on. Um, but as it keeps going, and you know, if our community gets more involved and steps up, and I think it could be a great example to other Superfund sites on what you can happen, because I know, I know that we're a strong community, and if everyone stepped up and had a voice in, like the reuse thing, for example, it could become something a lot better, obviously, than what it is. But. And then you mentioned that you get information from different areas. You, you've done your own research on the site in order for to do the community work, work mm -hmm. that you've done. Uh, what was useful or not useful when you're looking at all this information? I think everything's useful. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of history out there on on the Internet. Um, a lot of it was word of mouth, just talking, uh, similar to what you're doing, the oral history part, just talking to people and what their experience was. Um, there's a lot of stuff that, yeah, you got to take with a grain of salt here or there, or, you know, becomes hearsay down through generations. Um but I think all of it starts with some truth somewhere, so I think it's all useful. And were you surprised of anything that you learned when you were doing your research? All of it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think for me, the most surprising thing, um, well, for one, the the miles and the depth of the actual mine and the miles and miles of mine shafts everywhere, 
open mind shafts all throughout our community that aren't blocked off, you know. Um, my little brother's almost fallen in one. They're, I mean, they're all over the community, just thousands of them. Um, I guess maybe one of the things that surprised me the most was how EPA was only focused on arsenic and lead, which are, yes, they're, they're dangerous. They were obviously the higher limits. But stuff like beryllium, um, talking to a geologist that was helping me out, he explained that, you know, how rare beryllium was. It was only found in a couple places on Earth. Um, you know, it's used to make the, the spaceships, and it's very toxic. So to find that out, the EPA hadn't even brought that up, and that was one of the things that was found in my daughter's blood, was very concerning. Um, the radioactive material that's that's up there and around there, very concerning. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot of different stuff to be concerned about, for sure. And what advice do you have for state and federal governments that oversee the cleanup? Um, you know, I, I guess the best advice I could come up with is to talk to the community like they're people. Um, I don't think a lot of people really like, like to be part of a group or a name or organization. They're just people that live here and are concerned about their environment. So... Um, you know, people ask me a lot of times, well, what was the name of your, your group or your, I didn't have an, we were neighbors getting together talking about what we lived with or how your doctor's appointment went yesterday, how mine went today. You know, there wasn't a name behind us. It's, this is our life. Um, so to say, you know, you're part of a community organization or no, we were just members of a community voicing our opinion. So it would be more to kind of do individual discussions. With yeah, members. yeah, to be, or even if you're talking to a group of community, you know, members, not to approach it as a group. They're all there, you know, voicing their individual opinion. Um, to really listen to some of the concerns of the people and and more health studies, you know. and And I understand that that can be, can be tricky. You know, you got a lot of people moving into your community, the economy is booming, all this kind of stuff, and then you put out there, y'all are getting sick, you know, it, it can be a big political issue. Um, but I think that that needs to be addressed. You know, the, the amount of cancer within a block is concerning. You know, for me, who knows nothing about cancer, so it should be concerning for the federal government. And then, uh, did the Superfund site change your thinking about, uh, like, I guess, contamination in general in your community or in your household? Yeah. Um, you know, it, there's so much different stuff on, you know, the the factories and the manufacturing and the mining and and we need all of it. We need all of that as, you know, a community, as a nation. Um, but you have to be smart about it and you have to give people the opportunity if they are getting sick, you know, um, to voice their concerns or be able to see a doctor. And But I know it's all... It's all money and political, so, um, you know, I think for me, it, it's just such a fine line, and it's so hard to say, you know, when you see, when you see families that are making money, you know, they're able to support themselves, they're, they're all happy, they're all wonderful, you know, they bought a new house, that's all great, but if you get sick in the end, none of that matters, so, for me, I'm still kind of struggling with, um, you know, being on the contamination part and we need to clean it up and, you know, the families being able to make money, so. Uh, in, in addition to the environment, is there any other issues in your community that you think are important that need to be addressed? Um, well, yes. <laughs> 
Um, you know, a lot of our our town council is involved with the Superfund site. Um, the mayor, Terry Nolan, he has interests in it. He was a property owner. He still is a property owner. He's ran many different businesses and companies off of it. Um, so that whole political side of things is very frustrating to watch one of the elected officials up there um, try to tell the community that it's not that bad, um, you know, or trying to approve different different businesses to operate off there to make money, put money in his pocket, but the whole time you know that they're creating dust, you know, and and I've tried telling them before, that's great, Terry, you know, you're up there, you're running these tractors and stuff, but my daughter's at home and can't breathe, and um, so that really needs to be addressed is you know, everyone's got their, their hands in somebody's pocket and making money. And um, Terry's actually supposed to recuse himself at the town council meetings. He's not supposed to be allowed to talk about it because he is named as a responsible party. If you look at EPA's information on responsible parties, Terry Nolan is listed. So as an elected official, he cannot it's conflict of interest. He cannot stand up there on the bench and talk about the Superfund site. But the only time he ever removes himself is if I've been in the meeting and stand up and tell him in front of everybody, you can't talk about this. You need to remove yourself. Um, otherwise, he just tells the community that everything's great and wonderful. And and uh, he actually he dresses up as Santa Claus during the holidays, which is great. He makes a great Santa Claus. You know, I've got a lot of friends that take pictures with them and their kids and stuff. But it's so frustrating for me to see this side and then know on the other side he's approving things that are also hurting these people that, you know, he's trying to brighten their day. So that needs to be addressed. So is there anything that you would like to discuss that I might have missed, like a story that you would like to tell and have people remember, or just anything of your community advocacy that we didn't address or anything? Um, yeah, you know, the, I think for one of my main concerns has been the whole time is we know anything around there the smelter and the mine is bad um, and if nothing else while we're trying to figure out what everyone's doing with it that it should be fenced off um, I had a, a friend who whose two-year-old son got out of her house when she was taking a nap and they lived just over the hill from Iron King Mine um, and it, there was a lot of a lot of different mishaps. There was a lot of things that the sheriff's office could have done different that they didn't do, uh, search and rescue, that kind of stuff. But it was two days later that Emmett was found face down in the retention pond behind one of the buildings at Ironite. Um, and before this, I had been fighting a lot with EPA and the property owners. And, you know, when they applied the gorilla snot, it's I told him, well, that's just a waste of money because if we're not doing anything to keep everybody off, you know, we're just kind of spinning our wheels here. Why wouldn't you put up a secure fence around everything, you know, first off? And then when they found Emmett in the retention pond, um, and unfortunately it was probably 15 minutes that he had been in there from the time that they found him, um, that really bothered me that we lost a life of a little child, um, you know, it, and there were probably a hundred mine shafts between his house and Iron King as it was, you know, and he made it through all that to fall in a retention pond up at the mine. And to this day, that was <clears throat> eight years ago, nine years ago. They're still not fenced. It's exactly the same as it was. So <clears throat> is it going to take somebody else, you know, falling in something or so that definitely needs to be taken care of is fencing everything off okay Ashley so 
Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit again about the brick that's part of the, your home pave. Is it pavers? Yeah, so they used them um, to make up the stairs on my back steps and then also a little patio area out um, the side door. And what do those, uh, what do they mean to you and what do you want people to learn from that? Um, you know, when, that was kind of one of the things that I liked about the house when we first um, looked at it because I am a fan of history and old things and, and the bricks were neat. Um, and then as EPA started investigating and coming around and I was doing my own research um, and realized that they were part of the old smelter um, that had come down. On one hand, you have a piece of history in your yard. On the other hand, I had been using them to line my garden beds. The kids had played with them. Um, you know, we walked on them all the time. And then to find out that they were contaminated, um, you know, they did have higher levels of arsenic and lead on them. Um, and then it was brought up to me, I think, by you that, you know, asbestos could be a possibility, too. And I'd never even even thought about that. Um, so, you know, they're definitely a part of history. But then every time I walk outside, it's like, remind you, this is what we live with.